of what is Christians, okay? Uh, we've tightened... Uh, We've tightened our focus just a little tighter around this. We want to serve your families well, so if there's a way that we can do that that's being overlooked, uh, share it with us. We want that feedback, but more importantly, we want to partner with your ministries, and this is what we mean by that. We want to encourage you to be praying, God, what do you want me to be doing with my time, talents, and resources, the things that he has blessed you with? What does he want you to be doing with those things? As you pray that and as you seek him in that, he's going to put stuff there. He's going to put all different types of things there. Um, things from going and starting a Bible study to going and starting something out in the community that, that's drawing people to the gospel. That's Maybe it's things in your own family. Maybe it's very, very intentionally you got somebody in your crosshairs of I'm, I'm striving to share Jesus with this person. We want to know and we want to we want to encourage you. Jot those things down on those called cards back there. Stick them on that board so they can be prayed for. Those things get prayed for every week. Um, but we want to we wanna partner with your ministries. Um, in, in different various ways. So back of the chairs in front of you are connect cards. That's the appropriate place to put a prayer or need request. You can drop those in the offering lock boxes by the glass double doors on your way out, or you can do all those things at DeeringChristian.org. Uh, we use an app called Band. If you download that app, you'll create a profile, put your uh, real picture on there if you would, and a real name so we can tell you from Southeast Kansas because we kind of pay attention to who's coming into that group. And that's a, that's a way that you can just stay up to date on information that's, uh, that's coming out and different things like that. Um, what, what some parents figured out is that, Hey, camps, you know, we were talking about that and they, they sold out, you know, and they're like, Oh, what they, they sold out that, yep. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, it's busy, you know, it's a, that's a thing. And so we want to encourage you, you know, if you haven't, if you haven't done that, really pay attention here if for those younger camps and make sure that everything that you get them in there and get them signed up, use the information that's on there. We want to pay for half of your students camp. Um, one other quick thing, uh, middle school parents that's going into sixth grade uh, this next year up through eighth grade. Um, if you got any questions about something called uh, Mix, it's a trip that we're doing later in the summer. We'll be going down to Asylum Springs with your middle schoolers. Um, I really, uh, we need the commitments for that to make that trip work. And so I'm going to put some more information out on the uh, the DC Youth Band and kind of communicate that and let you kind of see what's going on. But uh, right now, we're really needing to get some, get a little bit of traction on that trip, and I think it's just probably a lack of my communication and understanding what exactly it is going on with that. But uh, yeah, it's good to good to see you guys this morning. Good morning. Let's praise the Lord. It is so good to see you. Let's stand and let's worship together.
is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. They cannot survive when we praise you. We're proud of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we to worship with you this morning, church. Yeah, give God some praise this morning. This week at camp, we, uh, we learned a new song, and it's called Holy Spirit Calm. And uh, it just talks about just inviting the Spirit in, just to, to uh, open our eyes and open our hearts to God. And uh, we want to share that with you this morning. Just, uh, it's pretty easy, and it's a lot of fun to sing, so sing along with us.
our perspective. Lord, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of, of pain and just the unknown, God, we just, we're just so thankful we can turn our eyes to you and to praise you, Lord, to praise you in all of our answered prayers and blessings and the peaceful moments. God, you're good. You're so good. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Regis. If you're visiting with us today, I'm one of the ministers here. It's great to have you. Hope to see you again sometime really soon. Um, at this time, our first through third grade, um, if you'd like, can go on ahead and go back to Sunday school, first through third grade. Um, today, we are continuing our journey through the book of Acts, and today marks a day that we're like a quarter of the way through quarter of the way through. So we will, we will finish this at some point in time. Um, if you would like to follow along today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 7. Um, we'll begin near the end, about, about verse 54 is where we'll begin today. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Last week, we covered 53 verses. All right, 53 verses. I, I still very much appreciate your patience. Preached probably a little too long. Um, to, today we're going to look at six or seven verses, so that's, that maybe that makes you feel a little bit better. Some of you who know me say, well, that's not necessarily a good thing, we'll see, all right, but um, that's what we're going to jump into, and uh, a pretty chaotic scene, to be completely straight with you. Acts is the history book of the New Testament, so when we look through it, we're, we're not looking through um, like like teaching subjects or letters written to churches full of, of type of these fancy doctrinal type of things here. Um, we are just looking at life as the church began from a historical perspective, but there's a lot we can gather from it. So let's ask God to be in the middle of this with us. Um, when I read from God's word today, what I'll be reading from as well as what will be on the screen behind me is the New, Amer New American Standard Version of the Bible. Now, I tell you that just so that you will know if it looks a little different than what you have in hard copy in front of you, that's fine. That's fine. I just want to make sure you're aware if it looks a little different. Um, so, let's ask God to be in the middle of this, and we'll jump into it. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come before you this day. Um, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that our faith is built upon history, Father. Your son came into this world, and he changed it. We thank you for that truth, and we thank you for the privilege of knowing not only that truth, but knowing him. Uh, Father, we pray that as we study today, you will guide and direct our thoughts, our discussion, 
We pray we will do justice to your word, and we pray, Father, that it will work on us if there's change that needs to take place in our lives. We pray your Holy Spirit will work within us as well. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Chaotic scene. It's kind of interesting jumping into the midst of, um, of a passage of scripture like this. As you'll see, it's quite chaotic in the middle of, of camp season. One, one week of camp behind us. JB survived. He's with us today. Got another one to go this week. Um, Bailey's probably still kind of twisting that arm to try to get him to do three in a row, but he's like, he's holding firm so far. <laughs> he is. Um, next week, I go out there, so hopefully, and I, I'm a little older than him. Um, I don't, I don't want to turn any more gray, JB. You can, you can manage it. You know, you're still a young guy, but, um, but camp is a wonderful thing. It can be kind of chaotic at times, but in the midst of all of that, there's also some really, really good things that take place. And um, my goodness, when we look at today's passage, that's something we're going to see. Um, there's something I think if we've been at this following of Jesus for any period of time, or even just life itself for a significant period of time. In other words, if you've lived a while, you have probably come to the realization that adversity is as old as sin, okay? Adversity in life. Um, and it, it, it is old as sin, and I don't just, I'm not just saying that as a phrase, as a, I'm saying literally, all right? The, the failure of Adam and Eve in the garden so many years ago ensured the existence of difficulty and opposition in our world. It is a given. And the question for us as believers in Christ isn't whether we will be opposed, isn't whether we will experience trouble or be persecuted. The question is how will we respond when this takes place? As we looked at last week through the majority of Acts chapter 7, we saw Stephen giving his defense, not of himself before his accusers, the Sanhedrin, the, the kind of the Jewish Supreme Court. He gave his defense of the gospel. He gave the defense of his message, the gospel, as Jesus came into this world. God came into this world. Jesus came. He lived, he died, he was buried, he arose, and he lives. And that fact changes everything. So he gave his defense of the gospel. And in the midst of that, he gave an incredibly powerful survey of his history and the history of his accusers because they were all Jews. From Abraham to Jesus, he went through the history. And in the midst of that, of that historical picture that he painted for them, he threw some pretty powerful punches in the process. And he ended his message, his defense with this, calling his accusers stiff-necked, calling his accusers uncircumcised in heart. And those might be kind of strange terms to us, to his accusers. That was, that was, that was hitting hard, all right? He called them betrayers. He called them murderers. He called them lawbreakers. He didn't pull any punches, and that is what set up the scene that we're going to see next. And in the midst of this scene, I think it'll be very obvious that we'll see the difference between calm and chaos, okay? Um, many of you know, some of you might not, that, that I grew up in um, the latter part of my youth in a drag racing family. Uh, I even did a little bit of it uh, myself back in the day. It's been a long, long time ago. But, but my dad still drag races. My brother um, drag races, and, and they go to Mo Smoke and Moke and Dragway over between Pittsburgh and Joplin. Been going there for years and years. And, and every Memorial Day and every Labor Day, they have a really big race over there. Um, big money payout, a lot of people there. We had planned Audrey, one of her, <laughs> crazy enough, one of her best friends races over there as well in a junior dragster drives like 80 miles an hour in the eighth mile, and it just blows my mind. All right, but anyway, okay, so, and they come to church here too. They're not here today, probably drag racing today, but anyway, so, uh, so that's, so Audrey wanted to go. I wanted to go. We had it all set up to go on the Saturday of Memorial Weekend. My dad and my brother went over there on Friday night, because if you want to get a good parking spot within the pit area, you got to get there on Friday night. So they got there. My dad hadn't even unloaded his car. His car is pretty consistent. It's, it, he doesn't have to worry too much about it. My brother's truck, on the other hand, it 
it has a little bit of uh, every now and again. Okay, so so my brother is going up to take some some test runs, try to make sure everything's running good. It wasn't. Um, my dad, you know, I mean, he's 76 years old now, and he doesn't like, just turned that this week, matter of fact, so he doesn't like walking back and forth, so he takes his bicycle over there, because sometimes to the to the starting lane, to where you will park is a good quarter, sometimes longer than that, quarter mile. So he's riding back from my brother, taking a test run that didn't go the best in the world. So he's riding back to the area. They had parked by one another to meet him there. As he's riding along, there's a woman approaching him, and on a leash, she is walking a very big German shepherd. All right? He's seen this dog many, many times over there, didn't think much about it, and he's riding over it. Well, She's getting closer to him. He's on the bike, right on the main road. And then um, he thought, well, this dog's coming towards me. And the first thing pops in my dad's mind is, you know, I don't want to hit. I mean, if you're on a bicycle and you hit a dog, usually you come out the worst for wear in that situation, right? So he, like, comes to a stop, puts his left leg down, and the dog comes up, and he's expecting the dog to kind of sniff his leg. The dog grabbed his leg right around his calf area, and just crunched, okay? Um, He had about two-inch gaps in the back of his leg, about an inch and a half to the bone in the front of his leg. And, um, and, I mean, the dog just grabbed a hold and really didn't want to let go. And, okay, in the midst of all of this, this is is a crazy thing. And, And obviously, my dad didn't race that weekend. He had to be in the emergency room to about 11.30 that night. Uh, And... I'm kind of glad I wasn't there because I'm not sure if I had witnessed that how I would have responded, okay? I have an idea in my mind how I would have responded. It probably would have ended with me having a broken foot and getting bit myself is what I'm guessing because that rib cage of that dog, oh, man. You think in the NFL that they can kick those kickoffs? You had not seen anything until you see what I would have done to that dog, okay? And I probably would have gotten bit in the process. So, but my dad, this is what's crazy. Like, he was just, he said, it really didn't even hurt. It was kind of funny. He said, I never really got upset. I mean, he, he never even raised his voice. Now, the woman's hysterical, you know, at this point of all of this taking place. I mean, it was a chaotic scene that I'm quite sure if me or my brother had been, he's still in his truck returning to, because my brother probably would have kicked the dog harder than I kicked, than I would have kicked the dog, all right? Um, it's just all about response. I have no doubt in my mind if I'd been there, I would have made things a lot worse, okay? I have no doubt in my mind. When we look, as we're going to see the end of chapter 7, there's some firsts taking place here, folks. There's some big deals taking place. And when it comes to the responses of Stephen and the responses of his opposition, you talk about polar opposites, completely different ends of the spectrum. Let's begin in verse 54. It says this, now when they heard this, remember he had just thrown some pretty strong punches, called them... Uh, uncircumcised of heart, called them stiff neck, called them betrayers, breakers of the law, murderers. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Cut to the quick. We've already seen this term used earlier in the book of Acts, and we talked about it a little bit last time. We won't spend a lot of time on it. But I'll tell you, the picture that the Greek paints is this. Now, this isn't literally, but figuratively, they were sawn in two. All right, they, they lost themselves. They were so furious. It says they gnashed their teeth. Just imagine this. Now, I have to wear a bite plate when I sleep, not because I'm angry in my sleep, okay, but just because I grind my teeth. But we're talking about a response here that you clench, you clench that jaw so tightly that the teeth are literally grinding against each other. I mean, they are furious. And the picture painted here by Luke, the author of Acts, a little bit later, we'll talk more about who helped him paint that picture, all right? But, but the picture painted by Luke is not a pretty one. This is not the kind of crowd that is going to behave rationally. And you take that and just compare it to the image, their image of rage, of uncontrollable rage, with the response of the Apostle Stephen. This is Apostle. I almost want to call him Apostle. He was not. He was just a guy within the church, okay? 
Let's see what it has to say about what Stephen does in the midst of this rage. Verse 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, by the way, that is a description that we get of Stephen time and again, full of the Holy Spirit. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So we've got this scene that is about to break into utter chaos, and we have Stephen here as serene as a mountain valley lake on a calm morning when the steam's just slowly rising out of it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it is just the picture of calmness. But the picture being painted here by Luke and the words that are said by Stephen, they show more than him just being calm. He uses a title here of Jesus. He says he sees the heavens opened up, and standing there, he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is the last time in the New Testament that we are going to see this title used for Jesus. Now, you'll see something similar a couple times in Revelation, the Revelation of the Apostle John, where it says, one like the Son of Man. Okay? But this is the last time that we will see someone say of Jesus, the Son of Man, using that title. And you know the only other one in the New Testament besides Stephen to use this title was Jesus. Jesus used it of himself. Now, there's some interesting things about this. We need to look at Stephen's use of Son of Man here and see the significance of it. It's bigger than you might think. First of all, Stephen evidently and correctly saw Jesus as more than a Jewish Messiah. He saw him as sitting on the throne over and above all of creation, all nations, all galaxies. He is above all. So first of all, that's what Stephen sees and why he uses this title, Son of Man. Secondly, he describes the presence of the Messiah at the right hand of God the Father. This is so much more powerful and heart-satisfying than temple ritual had ever been. Remember, Stephen is a Jew speaking to Jews. And the Jews he's speaking to, part of the reason they're so angry with him is because he's saying that the temple doesn't mean what it used to mean. Jesus came and fulfilled all of that. And the point that he's making is, you can come here and offer your sacrifices, but my advocate, and your advocate too, if you will just listen to my message is seated right now. He's standing at the right hand of God. What about coming to a dot on a map and offering sacrifice compares to having your own personal defense attorney standing and seated at the right hand of God? Your advocate, your closest confidant. Follow that with this. What Stephen is saying here, and the picture that he's painting is this, Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, because that one like the Son of Man is not just in Revelation, it's in another place, it's in Daniel. And you can turn there if you'd like. Keep a finger right here in Acts chapter 7, and we'll make this easy. Turn back to Daniel chapter 7. Now it's back in the Old Testament, if you find Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, you're getting close. Okay, you find Daniel, if you turn to Daniel chapter 7, I want you to turn to verse 13. Daniel was an incredible, incredible prophet of God. He was one who saw visions that, man, something else. We're still talking about him today. This is one of them. This is what it says. This is what Daniel saw. Daniel 7, 13. I kept looking in the night. The visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory 
and a kingdom that all the peoples and nations, men of every tongue might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. A lot of people take that and they apply it to what's coming, what is prophesied in Revelation. Here's the deal. It's already been fulfilled. Christ has already come before the Ancient of Days. God the Father, Yahweh, he has been presented. And he is over everything. Jesus' fulfillment of Daniel's visions showed that there was no place anymore for any institution that gives one nation religious privilege over other nations. Stephen is saying with this vision that the temple was over. Jesus finished it. Now, that's not all that he was saying about this son of man at the right hand of God. Catch, catch this. Other places we see language like this, we see the son of man, what's his posture? What is he doing at the right hand of God? He's seated at the right hand of God. But what does Stephen see him doing? Standing, standing at the right hand of God. You know, Now, it might have changed in our society a little bit. My goodness, some of you might have watched a little. (laughs) I don't know why anybody watched this. I don't. But there was a certain trial that a lot of people was mesmerized with for quite some time, for like weeks. You know, it was on TV and all kinds of stuff. And you'd see witnesses in the trial seated seated in the witness stand. That's not the way it always used to be. When it used to be in their day, perhaps even before the Sanhedrin, would some become before the court as a witness? They stood. Okay? So we have a witness standing. We have Stephen confessing Christ before his opposition, before the Sanhedrin. What do you have Jesus doing? You have Jesus being a witness as well, standing, confessing his servant and the action of his servant before God the Father. Brothers and sisters, we serve a Savior. We have an advocate who cares, who loves his people. And when we stand for him in this world, He is proud of us. Do you understand that? Jesus was standing in honor of Stephen. It is no wonder Stephen's face shone like that of an angel. You can remember that's kind of where this all, he had the face of an angel. Throughout this entire chaotic scene, he had privy to something that nobody else there had privy to see. So we have Stephen completely calm, Completely serene through all of this. All right, now let's go back to his opposition. Verse 57, back in Acts. They couldn't take it anymore. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice. (laughs) And get this. Have you ever seen, moms, you ever seen one of your little ones do this? Cry out with a loud voice and cover their ears. I'm not listening to you. Not doing it. All right, so it's not only covering your ears, you also got to yell really loud so you won't hear anything somebody's trying to tell you. That's what we got going on here. This is a royal fit being thrown, okay? But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. A little bit more about him here in just a second. Something you might be wondering, and it would be a very, very good question, a very astute question. Why did the Jews go to Pilate to have Jesus executed? They did not have the authority to do it of their own volition. That authority had been taken from them by the authority of Rome. So how do they have the authority to do it here? So let's just think about this for a moment and think about it logically. First of all, Stephen, he was a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. He was a, he was a good man, but he wasn't Jesus. Jesus had spent upwards of two and a half to three years becoming very well known. If, if the Jews had tried to do something similar to Jesus, 
my goodness, it would have turned everything upside down. Rome would have come down hard on them, and it would have been very, very bad for everyone. So they yielded their authority to Rome. Stephen, a little different story here. And Pilate was known to turn a blind eye if it wasn't going to cause too much fuss. All right. So yes, this would take place. The Jews technically did not have the authority to execute anyone, but it did happen at times. Now let's just talk about their method here. Remember, we know all about the Roman method of execution, right? Okay, if it's not a Roman citizen, crucifixion. We know that well. Let's talk a little bit about this, this Jewish method of execution, stoning. All right, the Mishnah in the second century, which the Mishnah was kind of loosely based on the law of the Old Testament, they took, took it and they added to it, and, and courtroom settings, um, social situations, basically practical areas of life of the Jewish people was governed by the Mishnah. And the Mishnah from the second century described how this would take place if someone was going to be stoned to death. At the conclusion of the trial, when the charge had been laid and they had been convicted of the charge, the condemned would be taken to the stoning place, if you will. A little bit more about that place here in just a second. Now, 10 cubits from the place where they would be stoned, about 15 feet Away from the place where this individual would be stoned, the witness is given the opportunity to confess. Okay? All right. After this has taken place, they go to four cubits from the place where they will be stoned, and the criminal is stripped of their clothing. All right? After this takes place, they are either dropped off a ledge or into a pit that would be twice the height of an average man. And how this would take place is they would face they would face the ledge, the pit, the opening right here, face first, and one of the witnesses in the trial would come forward and push them in the back, face first down. Lots of times that in and of itself would, would kill the individual. Okay? So then they would come down off the ledge, they would roll the one who had been shoved in, the criminal, over if they, were, uh, if they weren't able to move at this point. If, if they were already, if, if, they, if, if the drop killed them, then it was over, it was done, the job was done, all right? But if the drop did not kill them, they roll them over so that they face upward, okay? And now the second witness in the trial takes over, and they take a large stone and drop it right onto the chest of the criminal. Oftentimes, this would kill them, and if it did kill them, the job was done. But if it did not kill the criminal, then everyone there would begin lofting stones on top of them. Here's the thing. According to the Mishnah, if there is any legal loophole whatsoever in the midst of this, you don't do this to the quote-unquote criminal. You do not. The execution does not take place. It is a serious, it is a solemn occasion. Now let me tell you something. Does that sound anything like what just happened and what is happening to Stephen? I, I, I don't think that is fairly describing the atmosphere of Stephen's ex execution. It is a chaotic scene. And in the midst of the chaos and the fury, we see something else taking place. Look at verse 59. They went on stoning Stephen. And as you can imagine, this probably does not take a long time. As I said, before most of the stones are even thrown, he's already taken a beating. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. These words might sound a little familiar, but they are different. Do you remember what Jesus said before he died on the cross? He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Who did he yield his spirit to? God the Father. Who does Stephen yield his spirit to? His advocate in heaven his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Stephen knew full well who had been given all authority in heaven and on earth. See what happens next, verse 60. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. With his very last words, Stephen cries out for mercy. You catch that? But he's not crying out for mercy for his own sake. He's crying out for mercy to be given to the ones throwing the rocks on him. And after this, Luke writes for us, Luke the doctor says he fell asleep. Such an unexpectedly peaceful description in the face of this brutal death. How in the world could this man have been so peaceful in the midst of all of this? You know how? This is the death of a supremely confident man. (laughs) He knows what's awaiting him when his eyes close for the final time. He knows his advocate will open his eyes again. Let me tell you something. This is the first, the very first follower of Jesus to lose his life for his faith in Jesus Christ. And guess what, brothers and sisters? Stephen set the bar pretty high here. (laughs) Remain incredibly calm in the midst of everything. Ask for mercy for the ones who are murdering him. His response shows us what is going on inside of Stephen and why he has reason to be so confident in the midst of a scene that most of us would cringe at being anywhere in the midst of. When I read this passage of scripture, I think there is a reason why this was included in the the history of the early church. You know why? Because response matters. How we respond to the world when the world opposes our message and opposes us, our response matters. Do you think this made an impression on anybody? And I'm not talking about us now. I'm talking about the people who were there to witness it. You catch the first part of verse 8? We hear a name again. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. You think this made an impression on Saul? whose name would be later changed to Paul? I got a question for you. It's pretty obvious from Scripture. There's a little bit of debate about it, but it seems pretty obvious that Luke had a Gentile background. Many believe, I personally believe, he was a Gentile follower of Jesus. Okay, guys, at this point in time, There's no Gentiles a part of this thing. This is completely a Jewish, the church is a Jewish thing at this point in time. And what I'm getting at is this, we're a long ways away. We're we're years away from Luke showing up who would write what we're reading. Who do you think gave him the details of what happened to Stephen? I don't see anything about Peter, James, or John being there. I got a feeling the guy that gave him the details was who? Paul. The Apostle Paul. It's the Apostle Paul who looked upon his face and saw that he had the face, it looked like the face of an angel. 
It's the Apostle Paul who saw this supremely confident man lose his life for his faith in Jesus Christ. It's the Apostle Paul who watched over the clothing of those throwing the stones. It's the Apostle Paul who would go from this so incredibly motivated that he would be one, he's like, we got to do more of what we just did to this guy. I mean, look at, we're going to look at this next week. Look at the rest of verse 1. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. You know what Paul, much later in life, would consistently call himself? Now, there was a number of things Paul would call himself. A servant of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, that's kind of tame. He's actually saying a slave of Jesus Christ. He would say, God's chosen instrument to bring the message of faith to the Gentile world. That's another way. He called himself an apostle. Because he had witnessed Jesus alive on the road to Damascus. We'll read about that in a few weeks. But you know what else he called himself on occasion? Chief of sinners. I'm quoting him. He said, because I persecuted the church. No, I don't think. Paul ever forgot the face of Stephen. And this is what's amazing, brothers and sisters. If Saul of Tarsus, whose name was soon be changed to the Apostle Paul, and by soon, I'm talking about in our written account, but it would still be a while, chronologically speaking, Don't let this escape your notice that Saul of Tarsus, who was going and throwing men and women, men and women, into prison, probably saw more than just Stephen lose their lives for their faith in Jesus Christ. If that guy could not only be forgiven of what he had done, but be used by God in such a mighty way, what's that say about you and me? There are many of us in this room that might not be too proud of our past. But I... I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who stoned anybody for their faith in Jesus Christ. Is that, is that any of you? I, I mean, we're tempted to say, well, Paul, he was different. He was a chosen instrument of God. Yes, he was. He was an apostle. There's a difference between us and him, for sure. But the same God who used him is the same God who wants to use you and me. And brothers and sisters, we can never let our low view of ourselves disrupt that. I've been told a number of times, I just, I want God to do this through me, but there's surely there's somebody else. Somebody better. What? You think that's what God's really looking for? Somebody better? God's looking for somebody willing to be used by Him.
And if God can use, guys, I'm just going to tell you the terms of what it looked like. You put, you put Saul into today's society, you know what he had been labeled at that point? A terrorist. A religious terrorist. And if God can take him and use him to his glory, to the glory of God, what's that say about you and me? So we come to our time of communion. We come as supremely confident people. Why? Because that same advocate that Stephen had in heaven, we have. That same spirit that filled Stephen in the midst of that chaotic scene and gave him confidence and gave him calmness in the midst of chaos is the same spirit that is available to you and me. And when you get put on the spot for your faith in Jesus Christ, your advocate is ready to back you up. And the Holy Spirit is waiting for the opportunity to speak through you. We are confident people, not because we're wonderful people. We're confident people because we serve a wonderful Savior. And our future is so, so secure. And I don't know about you, but when I read an account like this, it challenges me. Because I want to be the type of witness for Jesus Christ that brings him to his feet. What about you? So we come to our time of communion, we thank Jesus, not only that he died for us, not only that he lives, we thank him because he lives for you and me, his people, right? And he is in the presence of God the Father, representing us. For that we say thank you. Come, JB's already explained this to you. If you didn't pick up one of those cups after I get done praying here, just raise your hand. Keith will bring you one. Right? Give us a little bit of time to 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 communicate, to commune with God, to tell Him thank you for what He's done for us, to tell Jesus thank you for what He was willing to endure and what He still is doing for us to this day. And then after our time of that, I'll come up and, and close with some prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you. We thank you so much, Lord, for the incredible example of Stephen. May we be encouraged by it. May we be challenged by it, Lord. Lord, not just his willingness to take a stand for you, but Lord, his willingness to maintain a soft heart through it all. And still have a care and a concern for his persecutors as they literally murdered him. What a powerful example, Lord. We thank you for your spirit working through him. And we pray that we will be challenged by it. We pray also, Lord, that we would be encouraged by his confidence. Because we can have that same confidence. Because our Savior, your Son, lives. He bled for us. And yet he lives. And one day he will return. For us. And all of his people. For all of this, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Just stand with me, please. You know, it's such a delicate, delicate um, line that, that we walk as, as faithful followers of Jesus in this world. We talked about it a little bit last week. Um, one of the reasons that, that we can expect trouble in this world, and I'll, I'll be straight with you, when you look at the New Testament and, and the way it describes trouble that we face in this world, difficulty sometimes because the world can be evil, sometimes because the world's just rotten, it's just tough, and bad things happen sometimes, all right? Um, we are told to, to accept those with confidence and with joy. Wow. How, how, how is that even possible? One of the best ways I've heard it described, okay, uh, was in the words of C.S. Lewis, the Christian author of the 20th century, when, when he, he talks about in this way, and I'll probably butcher this just a little bit, but, but he says, he said that God whispers through the pleasures that we have in this life, Okay? But God shouts through our pain. It is his megaphone to awaken a deaf world. Now, for believers within that world, when we experience difficulty, it's just a reminder, we're not home yet. Okay? We've been made for another place. You see... When it comes to us being in this world, number one, we need to understand this is not our home. We are not citizens of this nation first. We are members of the kingdom of Jesus Christ first. Okay? Therefore, we don't get upset when we see stuff falling apart around us in this nation. Now, I'm not going to say it might not anger us. Yeah, yeah, because we're, we're, we're here for a while. But if we can keep the proper perspective, understanding we're a part of something so much bigger than any nation in this world's ever seen, and that this world is not our home, then we can begin to view things with a different perspective. Because when we experience trouble, brothers and sisters, the way that we respond matters. But you know what else matters? Truth matters. And there is truth. And it is absolute. Don't let anybody in this world tell you differently. And here's the thing. We are supposed to present that truth to the world. But we're instructed by the guy who stood there and watched them stone Stephen. We're instructed by him, by the Holy Spirit working through him in this. We speak the truth in love. Sometimes it's hard enough just to speak the truth. And you're telling me, preacher, I can't speak it in frustration and in anger? <laughs> we 
we're to speak it in love. Stephen looked at those lobbing the stones and he prayed for their forgiveness. He prayed that God would show them mercy. As I told you, he set the bar pretty high, folks. So, how we conduct ourselves in this world, it all comes down to our perspective. What kingdom are we really truly a part of? What home have we really truly been made for? And while we are here for a short time, who are we representing? And are we representing him well? Okay. Here's the truth. If you're here today and you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, your future is not bright. Listen to the call of the Lord on your life. Jesus died for you, you personally. He shed his blood for you, you personally. And he wants nothing more than to spend eternity with you, personally, with the rest of his family. Listen to the call of the Lord on your life. Because you don't know how much longer your life's going to last. And you don't want to wait. Okay. If that's you, I encourage you to talk to somebody soon. Today would be a great time for it. And there's a lot of people in this room who would love to speak with you about what it means to turn the reins of your life over to Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this day. We thank you so much. Again. For the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope that sustained Stephen through that mockery of a trial and through his, his unjust execution, Father. We thank you for the hope that sustains us, the hope that anchors us, Lord, the hope that helps us face difficult times, difficult days. And Lord, we pray that you would use us to represent you in this world. Use us this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Have a good week.